Cheers! <laughs> Hello, I'm Nick Hennigan. This is How to Make a Crisis Set of a Drama. The making of A Ghost of a Chance back in 1997. It was a weird summer for me. And this is a weird summer for lots of people. So I thought we'd, you know, we'd wrap. I'll drink out what happened. It's uh, quite late at night and I'm having a cheeky one to wet the whistle. Although a bit tired at the moment, but I won't go into that. I'll write another diary, maybe about 2020, the lockdown diaries. Maybe. Maybe not. Anyway, thank you again for watching and sharing the experience. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch, then you can always get uh, an email. Drop me an email at, at uh, info at mavericktheatre.co.uk or leave a comment downstairs below this video and follow us. That would be cool. I don't know why. No, no, do follow us because I've got some plans that might involve internet. Okay, so yeah, watch this space. Meanwhile, <clears throat> back to the summer of 1997. In fact, Sunday the 29th of June. <clears throat> well, the weekend's here. Last night, I went to Worcester with some mates of mine, Ron, Steve, Doreen and Brian, to see publicans Ray and Denise. Ray and Denise used to run the Baldwin pub in Hall Green, Birmingham, and we got to know them then. In the heady financial days of the early 1990s, a large proportion of our incomes used to go into their till. They're now looking after a couple of pubs in Worcester. It's a nice night, um, partly perhaps because none of me above named mates have anything at all to do with theatre or production. I've known Ron, Ron Edwards, all my life. Steve Kemp originally helped us with the uh, box office and Brian Norton I've known since I was around 10 years old. So although we are all now completely different with widely varied jobs and interests, we still s tend to fit together. A bit like an old, well-worn glove. We have too much in common history uh, to be separated by something as trivial as adulthood. We laugh and joke and wind each other up in an almost juvenile way, but nothing is ever intended or taken with malice. Just as well, really. When I happened to mention I ended up back at my place with a 14-year-old last night, their banter was given full rein. Nothing personal, Kian. They just don't know that you are mentally about 32. But as always happens when we get together, the others give me enough ammunition throughout the night to allow me to gain revenge. Brian is driving, so stays on a mix of orange juice, soda water and non-alcoholic beer. We rib him for being boring when sober. Uh, should you see a ghost of a chance, you'll know that Bob, the central character, thinks that it's his mate, Brian, who is really the voice of the ghost. Bob thinks Brian's playing a trick on him in the play. If you know the real Brian, Brian Norton, you'll know where the inspiration for my stage Brian came from. We get back from Worcester quite late and I rise and realise it's the day of the French Grand Prix. Michael Schumacher wins and shock horror, Damon Hill actually manages to finish the race. In last place, I think, but a finish nonetheless. I need to track down a director of Up and Under, Julia, because the money is so bad I dare not risk more than £50 per performer and there are eight actors in Up and Under. We're having some trouble casting. I phone Julia at home, but she's not there. She's been a little difficult to get hold of, but I know to keep the walls from the door, she sometimes works at the MAC, the Middles Arts Centre box office. I decide, as it's Sunday, and I also want to get out of the house stroke office, that I'll go down to the Mac and see if she's there, and then go and see my ma and pa afterwards. Fortunately, Julia is there, working at the Mac, so we have a chat and I give her some CVs that have come in. On my way out, I meet some of my new found friends from the Stage 2 Cabaret, who've been rehearsing all day for their Stage 2 stuff. Steve tells me he's off to the USA tomorrow to visit his brother for a week. Lucky git. Craig starts talking about the problems of working with kids. I think he's around 15. And when Kian arrives, I'm full of wonder that he got home so late on Friday, yet looks so fresh. I also charmingly bump into John Napier, who in spite of our cruel rejection of him for a ghost of a chance, looks quite normal, thank you. He's waiting for his mom by the bridge over the river at the entrance to the Mac. And until I speak to him, I feel like shouting, Don't jump! You did really well! Another case of turning up the dramatic volume, loves. I ask him if he will be in the film sequence, which he agrees to do. 
When I first see John outside the confines of a rehearsal room, he looks very innocent and vulnerable again. And I realise why I got a bit twitchy before. Oh, kids' lives and emotions. Very delicate and precious things. But after a couple of minutes conversation, he becomes good old John again, super kid and laugh monger. I return home with a Shell petrol station patent sandwich. Watch a survival special about creature eating crocodiles in the Serengeti or somewhere. It's always the Serengeti though, isn't it? And I'm about to leave for my aged parents to take them a good son when the phone rings. It's John Slater. I ask him how he's doing and he replies that he's not doing too well as he thinks his relationship with Lisa might be finished. John's always very cool on the outside, but he has a very big mushy bit inside. I mentally banish my parents and ask him to come over. He does. And we spend the evening mourning the fact that he thinks he may have been chucked by his bird. Have you noticed how sensitive I can be? He's been seeing Lisa, the ex-Royal Ballet dancer who's running our youth workshop for about four months, although he's known her longer. He knows there's something wrong and he's suffering a bit. We rap, but I can do nothing but be there for a mate. Then we come back and watch the highlights of the Grand Prix. Even Villeneuve spinning off doesn't cheer him up. Poor old John. Monday the 30th of June. 5.45am. <clears throat> Doctor, I think I might need the pills again. Can I sleep? Can I ek? It's typical, isn't it? I've been lying upstairs for three hours trying to doze off. And of course I've got a big day today. Off to London for a Financial Times Association of Business Sponsorship of the Arts presentation and champagne reception at Shakespeare's Globe Theatre with Vanessa Redgrave and a host of other celebs. Dress lounge suits. I have to think, I've still got a suit and it just about fits. As a working class kid, I should be well up for the occasion this afternoon and a theatre anorak, but instead I start thinking about a ghost of a chance and it's not conducive to a good kip. I'm suddenly worrying about the money. Every penny is accounted for, but the awards are made in stage payments and I'm starting to fret in case we run out. The Guinness people are aware that most companies in our situation are desperate for cash, but I worry in case I'm spending too much at this stage. Have I, have I moved away from the budget? Then I worry that, having seen the undamaged John Napier yesterday and asking if he'll be in the film sequence, I haven't written the film sequences yet. I haven't been in touch with Ireland or any of the companies that might help me film there. I haven't made the changes to our script. I haven't even prepared the rejigged budget for our funders. We applied to the lottery and Guinness at different times earlier this year, not expecting to get either award. We got both of them and in my mind's eye, I imagine a scenario where both funders have me in court, telling me that I want every penny back because we didn't submit a new budget in time. I plead integrity, not insanity, but the judge places a black cap on his head. I don't think for a minute either organisation would deny the validity of what we're trying to do on what is, in real terms, a tiny budget. But it's the sort of thing that rears its ugly head when you're trying to get to sleep in the early hours of the morning. Gosh and damn, deputy dog. Even the unauthorised biog of Robert De Niro I'm reading at the moment hasn't helped me sleep. In fact, it's probably made things worse because he works so blooming hard at everything. Oh, and he's a millionaire to boot. Oh, did I mention this book? Uh, my girlfriend pointed it out to me last time I was in London. I've become a recent De Niro fan since I saw This Boy's Life. He's rather good, isn't he? <laughs> Robert De Niro, rather good actor. World copyright, N. Hennigan. And I need a haircut. Will the Rover make it to London, do you think? Or should I try and get the train if I can afford it? It's too late to get the cheap £12.50 return fare. You have to book before 2pm on the day before you travel. <sighs> Better risk the Rover then. Will I have a time for a haircut before I go, if I go in the Rover? Perhaps not. I haven't ironed my suit shirt. I've only really got one shirt I can wear with the suit. Hmm, still can't sleep. Better aim to be on the road by 2pm, then if the Rover breaks down, at least I'll be able to get towed down there. Is that how you spell towed? No. T-O-E-D? No. T-O-W-D? Oh, hum. Ho, ho, ho. I want to work with Justin. Give him some grown-up acting lessons for Ghost. Oh, forget the bloody play. Go back to bed and try to sleep. You know you're tired, Hennigan. Oh, no, I am. The body's willing, but the mind is weak. Ha! <laughs> Quite appropriate. The weather's been terrible. Rain and all. 
Oh, blow this for a game of soldiers. It's back to Bobby De Niro, and if not, it's the internet. Tuesday, the 1st of July, 1997. <clears throat> White rabbits. Yesterday was an eventful day. Eventually, I managed four hours sleep. I arose, slightly fatigued, to a message from Lisa Conway. She wanted a chat. Knowing that things were difficult with her and Slater, I readily agreed and put my haircut on hold. To cut a long story short, she has finished her relationship with John, but more importantly for the company, the new plans she's made mean she's unable to run the summer school. I don't think it has anything to do with her personal situation with John. Lisa has been with the Royal Ballet since the age of 11, and she only left the company earlier this year. She's 25, I think. And I'm glad to say I saw her dance before she left the Birmingham Royal Ballet. We first met when she applied to be in a film we're currently making. Her application was unusual because not only was she a ballet dancer applying for an acting job, but her CV was handwritten in pencil. Being Birmingham-based, we saw her anyway, because we've always had a policy of favouring local actors. Any actor that lives in the Midlands gets an audition, however much they've done, or however their CV is written. And she was quite good. We gave her a part in the film as a murderer. After her shoot days, she very kindly gave us some tickets to see The Nutcracker. Lisa was dancing Clara, the lead girl. Shortly after she took the rather sudden decision to leave the ballet company, I think she came from a cosseted and protected environment into the real world rather suddenly, taking a variety of jobs, including chambermaid and working in a pub. She has lots of changes and adjustments to make, and her sudden lack of commitment to the summer school is, to a large extent, given her radical shift in lifestyle, fairly understandable. She is very apologetic, and I am gracious and understanding. I've always had a policy as well with Maverick of easy entrance, easy exit. Mainly because when you don't have any money, you have to rely on goodwill. My main concern is that Lisa makes the right decisions in her life. Although I have to admit to a little annoyance, not for me or for the company, but for the kids who would have enjoyed the course with her. I've now got to get my head around an alternative. I give Lisa a big hug and tell her not to worry about the summer school. She leaves and then I prepare the rover for its journey down to London. This involves copious amounts of water for the leaking cooling system and copious amounts of oil for the leaking engine. I had to buy a new battery because every time the outside temperature gets below about 50 degrees, the thing goes flat and refuses to start. The new battery has made a difference though. Well, at least the thing always seems to start now, unlike before. I finally get to London without any incident, apart from the fact that when you accelerate, it throws out this sort of oily smoke screen from the exhaust. It's a great way of dealing with the idiots that sit on your rear bumper, though, and I consider patenting my oil leak as a new keep-your-distance safety device. I leave the car at my girlfriend's in Hammersmith, change into my suit and jump on the tube. 30 minutes later, we've only gone one stop, so I make the corporate executive decision to jump out of Earl's Court into a taxi. If I could afford it, I'd travel everywhere in London by taxi. There's so much to see. I arrive at the Shakespeare Globe Theatre by Southwark Bridge about five minutes late, so I've missed the start of the awards. No real problem. It's an enjoyable evening presented by Sinead Kusak. I don't know how you spell her surname, and I'm having trouble saying it. I left my programme in the restaurant. Vanessa Redgrave and someone else whose name I forget. Various dignitaries and captains of industry are there. Are there. I see Adrian Noble, Artistic Director of the RSC. He looks quite normal for such a brilliant man. Allied Demek win a prize, which rankles with me slightly. As Ansels, the brewery were quite supportive of our pub theatre concept. They didn't ever cough up any cash, but they gave a sponsorship in kind by paying for banners at the Billsley pub and for our printing and photocopying, which was worth about £800 a show and a big deal for us. That all ended when Ansel's disappeared and became allied de Mech in late 1996. They gave 12 million to the Royal Shakespeare Company and told us we were too small to bother with. Well, good luck to the RSC, but we seriously considered giving up the whole concept of new audiences to pub theatre in Birmingham. We couldn't afford a production in autumn 1996. And then I got mad at myself. What was I thinking of giving up? After three years of poverty and on occasions real hunger, and struggling. I was living on £25 a week, 
Try doing that for seven days, including food, gas, electricity, and see what's left for a social life. It's not much fun, I can tell you. I had to rely on friends. So when the brewery pulled out, the situation was untenable. Slater and I shared a tea bag, you think I jest, and had a council of war. There'll never be a worthwhile financial return on our pub theatre project. Without some sort of subsidy, the figures will never add up to afford to pay even one modest salary. But why should Birmingham, as the UK's second city, be without a fringe-producing company and a fringe scene? When I started pub theatre on a semi-pro basis in 1992, an expert employed by Birmingham City Council told me that after his research, quote, the people of Birmingham are not ready for such a thing as pub theatre, close quote. What a complete and utter rubbish. If I get the chance, I'll tell you how this concept started. But at this point, in late 1996, it almost ended due to the lack of support from Ansells. I couldn't see how we could replace the brewery support. I tried writing to the chairman of Allied Demec, but all to no avail. So Slater and me debated and looked at our options. And if we did give up, what else would we do? Go back to the radio? Would I try social work again? Work in an office or a shop? So after much debate, we decided that we must keep on with pub theatre and new audiences. For Birmingham and for us. I am adamant that I will not be beaten. I have huge plans for the concept and I'm still only on the first run. We decide we must find a surefire success and gamble that enough people will turn up and pay tickets, uh, buy tickets to cover the extra costs. I decide on Teachers by John Gobber. We will have to reduce the costs and run it for just one week. So we start sourcing printers and banner makers that will give us the lowest cost and the longest credit. We returned to limited expenses for the three actors. Glenn Bays directed at a reduced fee. Nobody else knew it at the time, but Teachers was the defining moment for the company. If it had sold badly, I would have been in it up to me neck. Fortunately, it did rather well, and we were launched on a programme for 1997. In January, we did two by Jim Cartwright. A bit risky, but it was a play Glenn Bays really wanted to direct. Again, we could only risk running it for one week. We had the final demand from BT for the phone bill sometime before two. I phoned them. Hey, it's good to talk, and begged them for a little more time. 0933 was our only phone line and was used for taking reservations and bookings, as well as me talking to me mum. BT kindly allowed us more time, but they wouldn't allow us any more credit, so they cut off our outgoing service, meaning we were unable to phone out. Fortunately, we got by, although if I needed to phone anyone, I used to have to run up to the phone box on Kingsheath High Street with a pocket full of 10 peas. The start of two by Jim Cartwright was not good. Advanced bookings were slow and I could see doom looming. Then on Wednesday, the crit appeared in the Birmingham Evening Mail. Two was probably the most emotional piece of theatre I've ever seen. It concerns a frosty couple who run a pub. We ran the show as one act with no interval and it involved two actors playing the couple and all the regulars who visit the pub. We were fortunate in having Louise Chamberlain and Eric Kudrell. Louise trained at Birmingham School of Speech and Drama and Eric, originally from Sutton Coalfield, had just finished a tour with the Royal National Theatre. Glenn played the show with just two spotlights. If I can get a scanner, I'll put the evening mail crit in this diary. The play is both very funny and very sad, and I have to say I have seen some dreadful productions of it. Because there are only two actors, it's often the domain of smaller companies, well, such as us, and it's easy to create the most mind-numbingly boring bit of theatre. On this occasion, the combination of Lou, Eric and Glenn approved electric. Every night, and I mean every night, the last act of the play was punctuated by sniffles and sobs from the audience. In the intimate space of the upstairs round room at the Billsley pub, audiences were devastated by the performances. Having laughed themselves silly in the first half of the play, they would emerge at the end red-eyed from crying. Fortunately, word of mouth spread quickly around the city, and after the evening mail crit mentioned that the reviewer who came on the Monday, the very first performance. We usually get reviewers in on a Tuesday to give the actors the chance to have one performance in front of a live audience, but we couldn't afford it this time. The reviewer, though, had met a woman who was so worked up by the play, she would have to go away and cry again. After that, the phone didn't stop ringing. By Thursday, my frantic gaze at the figures was more relaxed. Because it's pub theatre and we want to be as different as possible, we tend to encourage people to just turn up on the night. It's a nice, relaxed thing to do, but it doesn't make my life easier in terms, in terms of calculating if we will break even, though. 
When John gives me the figures at the end of the show on Thursday, I did a little dance. Thursday was the night we broke even and we still had the weekend to go. Word of mouth had spread and I started to wish I'd run the show for two weeks. But it so easily could have gone the other way. <clears throat> the weekend was packed, sold out, and the other reviews appeared in the free papers and they were all unanimous raves. It was a close run thing though. BT were going to cut off even the incoming phone on the following Monday. I took great pleasure in paying that one particular bill. All this happened before we had heard about the Guinness Award and our Arts for Everyone Express Awards uh, scheme for a ghost of a chance. Guinness uh, were nominated for award, the FT Award, at the Globe and didn't get it. I was quite fed up at that, particularly in light of the Allied Demek win. I'm struck slightly by the sense of unreality about the whole affair. I feel very different. I look down from where I sit in the centre tier of the Globe Theatre and all the other people. They're all on salaries. They're all earning money. They're all special London types. I wonder if any of these other people who have just been on the huge guilt trip I have because I spent £9 of food money on a taxi due to the tube not running. I doubt it. One highlight is that I'm sitting next to a beautiful African businesswoman who wins a prize in the small business category for sponsoring an art gallery. She glows with pride as her partner makes his way down to pick up the award. The awards are like large knots of metal string wrapped into a ball on a coloured plinth. Try arty, Rodney. After the awards, I stand on the patio at Shakespeare's Globe and gaze out at the River Thames. I avail myself with a glass or two of the sponsored champagne and I wonder if Henry V line of England will ever be presented here. My agent has corresponded with Mark Rylance, the artistic director of the Globe. It's an impressive building and vastly changed from when I first saw it two years ago. It's such a shame that the actor Sam Wanamaker, father of Zoe Wanamaker, who was the driving force behind the Globe, died before it was opened. I chat to a girl who is with the Edinburgh TV Festival, down another glass of bobbly, and then I take my leave. The rain has held off, and it's a quiet, sunny evening. I walk easily over Southwark Bridge and muse on London. I think I have my sights set on the capital. I want to succeed here on behalf of Birmingham. If I can conquer London, I can conquer the world. Mm. World domination. An interesting idea for an uneducated kid from a council estate in Kingsheath, Birmingham.